And so today we have Jared Richardson and Curtis Despain from Primavera Tech. Is, did I get that attribution right? That's and close enough. It's a you complex got organizational it. structure they have down there. They are doing some amazing things, and they're here to tell us about that. So I'll just let you guys describe it from there, what you're doing and what you want to tell us about. Well, thank you. Uh, Curtis is going to lead off here since he's the boss, and I'll, I'll try and figure finish it up. Okay, so... Um, These are BYU graduates, so listen carefully to what they're doing. Yeah, I, I also graduated from BYU. Uh, Jared did as well. And then we have, um, so Jared Richardson, Curtis Despain, and then Dave Butler. He'll be walking in with some bottles of water, hopefully, so, mm -hmm. um, for me and Jared. But uh, Primavera Online High School is a nonprofit uh, public charter school in Arizona. It, uh, I'll get into a little bit <laughs> of that. Um, and then American High School Academy is a for profit. Uh, company that does uh, development of software, educational software, and digital curriculum for right now grades 7 through 12. Um, I represent American Virtual Academy as, as what all of us here do. Um, Jared and I have both um, been involved with the company really from the beginning 10 years ago. Um, full-time employee for myself, I think about seven years ago, but contract work with them since the beginning. And Jared, I think you were full-time before I was. I think so. Yeah. So we've really seen the growth of the company. I'll get a little bit, um, explain a little bit about that. But I'll, I'll start off with talking a little bit about um, kind of the business side of things and then pass the, t the time over to Jared to get more into the educational um, side of things and the instructional design. Uh, let me see how I can advance this. Here we go. So Damian Kramer was going to be here today doing this presentation. He was unable to make it today. That's the wild guy I'm talking about. <laughs> the guy that first, first walked in. Um, so anyway, but brief history. You know, served a mission in Spain. That's actually where I met him for the first time, uh, was when we were both missionaries in the same mission in northern Spain. Uh, he came back. He uh, went to Rick's College, uh, joined the Marine Corps, was with the reserves and as he went through school. I uh, went to BYU Provo after Rick's College. Um, for those that don't know Rick's College, that's BYU-Idaho back then. Um, graduate degrees from University of Phoenix and Thunderbird um, Business School in Arizona. And uh, he also worked for a short period uh, for the University of Phoenix. This was back before they were this big online school. In fact, he was like employee number six that kind of was involved in the online effort. This is a quick little insight to that. He was an enrollment counselor, which really was a salesperson then, uh, trying to recruit online students for University of Phoenix, and he was like employee number six in that department. And his students that he was working with would complain about the systems always going down. So he kind of got upset and went to his manager and said, what's going on here? Why?" Why are the systems always going down for my students? And so the guy says, well, come over here. And he walked him over to an old desk and said, see that underneath there? And he said there were three CPUs that were taped together. And he said, those are our servers. And that's why the school keeps going down for your students. So this was really the beginning of, of the University of Online. But he worked there for maybe a year, year and a half. But he was because it was small and they were just getting started, they would grab the whole team, throw them in a conference room, and they would start to strategize and talk about what this could be, um, what this online learning. So he was involved in some of those startup grassroots meetings and kind of caught that vision of online learning and kind of what the future might hold for it. Um, he went on to work at a, at a charter school in Arizona on the opposite side of town. And so he had a basically a one-hour commute each way, and he got really tired of that commute. And, learned enough about um, running a charter school that he said, you know, I'm going to just try to do this myself. I'm going to write a charter, submit it to the state, and see what happens. And with the experience that he saw at University of Phoenix, he said, there are no laws that prohibit me from doing anything online, so I'm going to have like, this digital content. And he really started what then would, nowadays we would call a blended center. So it was basically, you know, he rolled up his sleeves, he and his wife put a second mortgage on their home, started this. Uh, charter school, which uh, they just bought some space in a strip mall, built a computer lab with an adjoint office where they kind of ran it from, and then they, you know, tried to get 30 students to begin 
on site to start this charter. And it was kind of uh, teacher-led inside of a classroom of about 30 computer stations and digital, digital content. And that's how it got started. Um, so we see 2001 it started with 35 students. Uh, in 2003, Primavera Online High School was actually um, one of the states. Uh, the state opened up a pilot, online education, virtual learning pilot. Uh, they allowed seven districts and seven charters into that. And Primavera Online High School was awarded one of the charter seats. So for, this is probably the longest pilot program a state has had in this, but a seven-year pilot program. There was really an oligopoly where there were 14 um, online programs in Arizona that competed for the, the online students in the state. Uh, so Primavera just, um, and Damien really had this vision of where he wanted to take the school and, and really pushed for a better model. Uh, and we just started to experience uh, groundswell of growth. So um, 2005 was uh, first accredited by NCA. Um, I think that's advanced ed now. Um, and in 2006, there were about 600 graduates from Primavera Online High School. Today, we have um, over 5,000 full-time students uh, with about 1,200 graduates each year. About 20,000 students will go through the doors and take at least one course at Primavera. So there's a lot of, I think in Utah, they call them dual enrollment students. In Arizona, they're concurrent students, so they go to a brick and mortar school and take at least one class at Primavera. And so, you know, anywhere about 20 is a 20,000 students is a safe number. Um, it's some some reports will show higher than that, but that's not courses taught, but that's individuals, unique students that have taken at least one course. How many states are you in? So Primavera Online High School is an Arizona public charter school. Arizona is the only state that they are in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, what? At the same time, and let me advance to the next slide. Um, we have two organizations. We have Primavera Online High School and American Virtual Academy. So I've talked about Primavera Online High School, and really the goal there is personalizing the education. So finding a model that works to deliver an on, but it's a 100% virtual program. This, no student comes on site. Um, we administer the state standards tests, uh, proctor those physically. That's a couple times a year, and that's the only proctor testing and um, actual physical presence that the students ever have to interact with the school, otherwise it's 100% online. Um, it is designated as an alternative school. The demographics are, um, you know, 60% of the students self-identify themselves as an at-risk student. About 8 to 10% are parenting teens. Uh, there's about 12 to 15% uh, IEP students, so a lot of special ed. And then uh, just a lot of people that have, it's a second chance really, they've had experienced uh, you know, they've had bad experiences at a traditional setting, so they've been expelled from brick and mortar schools, they have behavioral problems, or for whatever reason, a traditional model wasn't working for them, and they self-identify themselves as an at-risk student. Now, the state of Arizona will also pay for a high school diploma up until the age of 21. So about 50% of Primavera students are 18 years or older. Um, this year is the first year that Primavera offers a middle school, so starting at uh, seventh grade, and next year it'll start at sixth grade. But as we focus and as uh, you know, as we've been able to improve online delivery of courses, um, we see a younger demographic starting to enter, and that's starting to grow. Uh, but traditionally, it's a it's a uh, older demographic for for these students. Now. Um, Primavera has gotten to a point where the student outcomes rival a state average. So the graduation rate of Primavera Online High School, although it is a, an at-risk population, uh, we do rival a standard traditional brick and mortar setting um, for course completions and graduation rates. Um, and then, you know, one focus to personalizing education is a very high teacher-student interaction. Have you compared the um outcomes on the state assessments, the national assessments, and I assume they're similar? Uh, yeah, and it depends which numbers you're looking at, but if you compare 
Primavera Online High School to other at-risk schools, well, we skyrocket above them, but if you compare them to state averages or national averages, um, if you compare them to charter schools, we're very close to the national averages. Um, in the reading, we're actually very, um, very close to state averages in the math. We yeah, we're actually above average in the reading and about uh, 10 points below in the math. Yeah. So math is a focus at Primavera Online High School. They're doing a lot of efforts to uh, try to improve in the math. What does the student-teacher interaction entail? Is that IM or is that camera? A lot of different things. So I'll, I'll talk more about that, but there's uh, at least five different ways that they interact. Well, yeah. yeah. Actually, I started listing them and I got to seven and I said, oh, where's that five that Jared always talks yeah. about? But yeah, there, there's lots of different ways that they interact. Um, so American Virtual Academy is a for-profit company. Basically, it's software development and curriculum development. So um, we have delivery systems, so a learning management system, a student information system, and also a parent-student portal, we refer to just as PSP right now. So those uh, different technologies that, that are really written. And so in the first year of the existence, so these two companies actually are founded by Damien and Vanessa Kramer, and were founded at the same time in 2001. And so there's a business relationship where one is basically providing services to the other. And that was um, written in the original charter and approved by the state, and that's how a lot of charter schools operate in, in Arizona. Uh, but for about the first five years of existence, AVA only focused on servicing Primavera. Uh, once we started writing our own systems, we realized that these systems could be a benefit to other other schools, and so we're starting to look at expansion and, and looking. ABA is looking to um, provide technology and curriculum to other schools as well. So, so ABA basically provides curriculum and and software and software, but not the teachers that would use that curriculum. It, it, not in Arizona. In Arizona, they're hired by Primavera. When we go outside the state, then uh, the ABA hires the teachers. Yeah. So it's basically, uh, it allows an opportunity for a school to operate their own program with their own teachers, uh, or if they needed help with the instruction, then American Virtual Academy could provide the teaching as well. But definitely, American Virtual Academy can provide best practices and teacher training and professional development to those online teachers because that's a new territory for a lot of a lot of schools. And American Virtual Academy in Primavera uh, has a synergy of working together. We've been under one roof for 10 years. So it's not like we're writing software and giving it to the education educational industry and saying, here schools, we hope this works for you, you know, enjoy it, use it how you will. Um, but we just know because day-to-day -day consulting where we have immediate feedback from administration, from faculty and staff from the students themselves. You know, we have that daily communication and consulting so that technology is always being developed in conjunction with uh, a significant uh, school. Evaluation. So uh, just a quick glimpse into the value chain. So this is a little bit of business. So Damien with his MBA from Thunderbird is going to give a lot of this kind of business side of things. But just understanding the industry where we have content providers, which are you know your publishing companies, your HMH, Pearson McGraw Hill, curriculum providers in the online space, which your Apex Learning, Aventa Learning, uh, Florida Virtual provides curriculum, and ABA provides curriculum in that space as well. Uh, we have operators or technology, so there's a the Blackboard and Moodle doing LMSs, school management systems, or SISs by Pearson and, and HMH as well, um, and then. American Virtual Academy is also operating in this space. And then schools, so the K-12 Inc. or Connections Academy, which is now Pearson, um, and Florida Virtual School. Primavera operates in the school. So there's the, like in the space where ABA is and where Primavera is. Now American Virtual Academy may in the future write uh, their own charters and have you know some type of a uh, national online charter high school. And then and then ABA would enter the school space, but for right now, this is how, how our organizations are kind of split. Okay, here we go. So, first message of, of our time here is education, education is, not, is a service, not a commodity. So, uh, 
there's this uh, service-related marketing acronym Phoenix, and I'll just quickly go through this, but uh, if you can read the board, I don't know how, how well you can see it back there, but you know, it's a perishable, uh, education is perishable, so it's delivered and consumed immediately. Uh, this could become a point of uh, argument where you could say, well, online now lets you archive sessions or archive education, uh, or it could archive data, and, sh and, and so it's not perishable, but the actual instant where a student is learning is, is actually that immediate consumption. So, um, so it's a perishable item. Uh, education is heterogeneous, so each experience is unique. Uh, Operation-based, so excellence in operations is really the key to a successful uh, education. The encounter, so students learn through interactions with their teachers. We have non-conditional guarantees, so we can guarantee that it's taught by certified teachers, that you'll get an accredited diploma, and that it's aligned to standards. It's intangible. You can't drop your education on your foot. You can't contain it on a diploma. So it is intangible, and it's excellent people. So qualified, qualified, trained faculty and staff and administration are definitely key and makes all of the difference in, in, in our industry. So we share that, that viewpoint of service, uh, of education being a service and not a commodity. I know that, uh, I think, as we've seen, like, the last years of, of online education, there's companies, especially the publishers, that see this, that they'll say, well, online education will become a commodity. It will be a really low-cost or free thing that anyone can get. And although some of the components may be a commodity, but education itself is definitely not a commodity. Uh, so, we have a service gap model, so in service markets, uh, in business, we have this triangle of the management, the customer, and the employee. Moving into education, you know, we use terms of administration, students, and faculty. And there are gaps between each of these. So we have a communication gap between each of the, of the collectives. There's a design gap, a delivery gap, and a knowledge gap. And, and each of those gaps exist between each point of the triangle, but today I'm just going to focus real quick on, on these three gaps um, in, in between these different collectives. So, in the knowledge gap, um, in online learning, there's definitely a knowledge gap between those that are the administration of the school and the actual students and the parents. So we group the students as the customer. And so online delivery and data systems allow the administration to become closer to the students. Uh, the systems you know, can allow the administration to give announcements to students and to parents and it allows communication from a parent or a student to reach management without having to go through the instructor uh, and can provide that, that type of communication and accommodate that communication. Um, we have an adjunct model. so. Looking at, at how Primavera operates, they have about 200 uh, faculty, so instructors. 50 of those instructors come into the office every day and work an 8 to 5 shift, and they're full-time faculty. About 150 of the faculty are adjunct teachers, where they'll teach at a brick-and-mortar school, and then they'll teach a class in the evening at Primavera. Or they could be a stay-home mom, or have some other uh, you know, health problem that would keep impede them from going to a brick and mortar, and so they teach three or four classes at Primavera, but they do it from home and they don't come to the office every day. So this is a model that the administration can use to connect with the students that isn't a traditional teaching model. Uh, parent engagement is really key to closing that gap between administration and and um, and the students. So uh, we have you know kind of a parent student portal which really takes. Uh, transcripts, it takes uh, the student's academic status <coughs> and any you know, RTI um, efforts and it displays that data to the parent and to the student in real time so at any moment a, a parent can log in, not only see the progress of the student in classes that they're in, but see all of the history that that student's had at, at Primavera or any other school because they, they bring all the records together and they see their complete transcripts there. Uh, they also have tools to be able to let them um, say, well, if I had my student go to one summer school class or two summer school classes, then they could graduate uh, you know, a semester earlier or a year earlier. 
so they have those types of tools. Um, and then the last is monitoring student proficiencies. So of course data systems are there to provide that, that monitoring. Now talking uh, or addressing the faculty and the, and the students uh, gap there, continuous communication with a student is key. And as, as Jared said, there's five primary communication points, and to answer your question a little bit there, and I'm sure you'll get into a little more detail, but um, we start, oops, back here. So there are, there is a community, so there's a scaled down Facebook model, that's kind of like the students talking to each other, peer to peer in the hallways, it's not graded and it's not part of a, of a classroom, so there, there is those there are those systems to help build a sense of community. I belong to a school. I can socialize. So uh, those are those are part of the systems. But there's also a class blog. So that's where it's basically in, in an LMS or learning management system. This is like the teacher announcements. And but rather than just having teachers posting announcements, we have to all you know there's commenting. So it's kind of Facebook style. If the teacher says, "How was your weekend?" Then the students can communicate with each other in, in an ungraded. Uh, fashion, but now they're only communicating with their teacher and the other classmates in that class. Again, again building a sense of community. It, it's not just a student with their computer, but I'm there with other peers that I'll be learning together with. Uh, there are discussion boards, so these are asynchronous discussion boards where they're, it's a you know standard, tied to a standard and learning something and discussing what they've learned. There are um, Mess internal messaging system, so it's like an email, but it's in the system, so everything's archived and stored. Uh, there's um, jumping kind of to this quality service matrix. Did you mention the clubs? No, I haven't. Uh, there, there are social clubs, so students have a chance to interact with each other through a Spanish club. Spanish club. Uh, there's a the Stuco, so the student government. They're actually organizing the first prom this year. Uh, they did a winter social, and that was a great success. And uh, we're actually there's an honors, an honor roll, and I think it's the first online key club. So uh, they're they are starting the key club there. Do you have another question? So I'm just wondering, uh, you have these two service models: one where you're servicing a school where students actually go through and use your services in the pursuit of a degree that they're getting from and almost entirely from you, right? Mm -hmm. And there's other students who, you know, come and take one or two courses as part of their other. Are, are those, do those students interact in the same courses? They are, they so are. So how do these they cultural, it would be like me going to Provo High School but then going to a club at Tim, Tim View High School or something like that. So, it, I mean, it, it's kind of cool. I, I really like the idea, but I'm just wondering how, what the interactions kind of look like when you're mixing, you're, you're doing something that's different from kind of the cultural norm when you think about high schools. And yeah, well, <coughs> one, like, so for... The school has actually just created a mascot, and they, now the, you know, the marketing team in the school was involved in picking the mascot, but basically they came up with five mascots and let the students vote and choose a mascot. So um, now they're going to name the mascot. This week, I think, they're, it's open to the students to name, and that'll be students that are full-time students or the concurrent students will also interact. One thing I'd add to that, just uh, think to uh, qual many fears is that all student communication electronically is monitored and looked at by live eyes before it's posted, even on their social networks. So bullying, uh, predation, all those kinds of things are eliminated. Yeah, every picture and every blog post or comment is, is actually read by human eyes. So, How many folks do you have doing that? Yeah. <laughs> well, right now there's two people that do that. They don't do it full time though, but they're checking on it. Actively, uh, now Facebook is something that we don't control. What content is being posted, but we do have. I think there are 2,700 a few months ago when I looked, 2,700 fans. It was a, at the beginning a way to channel communication to the students, but now students are using it to socialize. Uh, we've been very lucky that our Facebook page is just 
been very safe and very good. And we have the same team that's monitoring the internal community. They're also monitoring Facebook and addressing any concerns. I think we've only had one instance where we've had, had to remove a post because it was inappropriate or something. But other than that, the students do a really good job with policing other students. And as soon as a negative comment is posted, other students will jump in and, and support and explain to that student. And so we really have to kind of stay hands off in a lot of cases and let the students um, help each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so we have this um, matrix of, of about 20 different data points that the instructors are measured by. And so it's looking at, uh, you know, what percentage of the discussion boards are teacher posted versus student posted. It's looking at how many phone calls have gone out. There are, uh, there's a, a matrix or a rubric of, of requirements for the teachers. Uh, so they have to, you know, they, Primavera holds a very high and frequent interaction. And so they have high levels, and high standards for that. And that's kind of that secret sauce of having an online program that works because it truly is teacher led. So they're, they're required to contact via phone on a weekly basis, all of their students. And the data systems have reporting, so they could, you know, look at the, the quantifying the data, and the, the teachers are given a score, a weekly score that's presented to them, and they also see the scores, uh, the average score of all of the other teachers, so they can kind of self-monitor. Then we have an auditor that will go in and be that secret shopper and do the qualitative um, review of how the communication is, what they're communicating, and will kind of be two weeks in a classroom and then they'll reveal himself to the teacher and then coach them on improvement opportunities. So, so are teachers paid based on um, courses that they teach, or are they paid based on number of students that they're able to get through certain learning outcomes or through certain, you know, uh, <coughs> you know Yeah, I know what you mean. So, so to answer the question, I, you know, I'm not that familiar with the, how the, the pay is, but I do know that they do have a, a base and that they do have incentives for course completion and, and achievement of the students. Yeah, so that's the, all fact. The state of Arizona allowed certain incentive pay. So they give a base salary and then they give an incentive pay based on a number of factors, one of them being course completion rates. But several others are the, the evaluation they get from, from uh, parents and students themselves, uh, as well as the uh, accomplishments of the students. I guess since you're a charter, there are different it's laws. It's public and still, so you, you still have to fall within the, that you can't completely No, we can't use of, total incentive pay, no. Yeah. you have a question about How does that pay compare to teacher in a regular school? Is it above salary of them or below salary? The potential is above salary. But the reality uh, but it's is very competitive. No, reality is very competitive. We actually like, especially for our full-time teachers, we have uh, we retain about ninety percent of the teachers that come that come on board as full-time. We have very few that that leave once they have become. Uh, but part of that is also due to good practices in hiring and good practices in training and educating people before they actually come on board to be a teacher. Plus, it's a full-time job. We, we teach through the summer as well. <coughs> so they're paid as if they were working for 12 months rather than nine. But, but is it, so, so when you're seeing the first come on below salary, but they can't earn above? Well, it, 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 no, actually, it's a, it's a little above the state averages. Okay. Yeah. And some of the rookie teachers that uh, really kind of learned, you know, and that been, been taught about online and have had online courses at the university really have that vision of how that can work and, and come on board right away and they're excellent online teachers even though they're young uh, in their professional careers. Um, I, I have one other question about the evaluations where you brought the parents and the students in. What mm -hmm. kind of things did parents and students evaluate the teachers on? So, um, I don't know, Jared, do you they have, uh, we have two major evaluation pieces that uh, are ongoing. One of them is, is on the LMS itself. It, there's a rate this activity which the student can rate and at the same time ask, you know, comment on, on the teacher or how it was taught and so forth. Then there's the end of course survey that they use where the, there are a number of things that it asks. One of them is, is uh, how they felt the teacher was, was effective or not effective. 
Um, and they have, it's not just one question, there's several that are, are follow up through that. Does that answer the question? Okay. In fact, we're just rolling out a new survey uh, tool to where the surveys don't have to be tied to a course, and then they can also be um, kind of dripped in so a student doesn't feel like, you know, I'm obligated to answer 10 questions. So we can go a question at a time, and they can tie it to at a certain activity in a course. Or they can say, hey, just on this date, release to all students this one question, and we can start to get accumulate data that isn't like in a very formal survey um, setting. Um, but then the, the activity rating, where a student has the opportunity in the, in the learning management system just to rate every single activity, that really provides good feedback to what's reaching the student and what's not. And then it provides good feedback to the curriculum team to be able to modify the curriculum as needed to have a, a, a curriculum that is reaching the student. And does that include students that complete courses and don't complete courses, or...? Right, and this is another way that the, that the survey tool helps, is that you can do beginning of the course surveys and start to accumulate data that way. The rating system is throughout the entire course, so even if a student goes into it and, takes, and gets two activities into a lesson of ten, you can accumulate data from the rating of those, of those uh, two activities that they did. Um, Consistent user experience. So this is another thing that American Virtual Academy does with, with all their curriculum is they have a consistent model. Not only of instructional design and pedagogies, but the delivery is consistent. So a student learns how to take one course, they know how to take all of their courses. They, they kind of know the system. It also helps the administrators understand how to create teacher-student ratios and teacher expectations and workloads. They know that they can be consistent on what the what the work required from the teacher teaching end is. So uh, jumping on to this design gap between the administration and the faculty really is where the decisions of what <coughs> curriculum is and what technologies are going to be used and what tools are going to be provided to the faculty to, uh, to deliver to the students. So you know, here we have disruptive innovation. So we have online education really being a tool that if used correctly can really bring the gaps on all models or on all sides smaller to where we can find that middle point of, of one source that can bring everybody kind of closer together. So are the, are the faculty actually uh, developing mm -hmm. the curriculum and designing the courses for the faculty? You know, because there's lots of different models and in many yeah. models you have a design team it's designing the curriculum mm -hmm. and the courses, and the faculty are just using that curriculum and teaching the courses, but they don't have like, many design decisions to make. Right, and so this is uh, basically how we have worked with the instruction staff on a number of a number of different levels. But one level is that um, because we've been under one roof, and we have a curriculum team that's ABA employees over here developing curriculum, but we have that constant uh, kind of feedback and kind of um, knowledge share between the teachers that are actually administering the class. But we've also um, have the need for letting teachers personalize the courses. So the curriculum team makes sure that it's, that it's all following the pedagogies, it's aligned to the standards and everything, but we allow the teacher <coughs> to post at any point in the course their own instructions. They can provide links to the other mm -hmm. sites on the internet and they can upload their own files. So if a teacher wants to do their own PowerPoint and put into the course, they can at any point of the lesson. So it's kind of the best of both worlds where you have the, the structure and we can have that non-conditional guarantee that it follows the standards. So teachers cannot turn things off that they can augment and add to any point of the, of the course. In fact, that's one of the data points that Primavera teachers are required to do is to go in and, and contribute and personalize the course to the, how they want to teach. So is, is that true with assignments too or just exams? So, so could teachers say, ooh, I don't like this assignment, but I think this assignment that I'm thinking of would actually be better at getting them towards these outcomes as measured on the exam or whatever? Could they yeah, definitely on an assignment they could and the instructions say, hey, ignore this and we're going to do this. Primavera does not really, um, they don't ask that the teachers do that because they like that there's consistency. Right. But other schools that use our systems definitely would have that flexibility. Or if there's a special ed student um, that needs a, a modified project, they can definitely deliver it. So, uh, and then most importantly, again, you know, 
online education is evolving, so it's design, design, design. So that's one of our tasks as a, as a community of educators to come up with solutions that really um, can deliver an online experience that works for the students and we can achieve education through the, the tools that aren't going to be going away. As you, as you, is there kind of a fatigue factor where uh, once people have taken a certain amount of instruction, they, they expect a higher quality? That is, do you find that expectations of your students escalating over time? Uh, where what was good yesterday and what was kind of cool yesterday isn't cool today, and that's one of the reasons you have to keep designing ahead? It's a beautiful segue. I'll let Jerry kind of take off. <laughs> Definitely. And we're, we're always going through that. Remember, check, not catch. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're familiar with this. Okay. Uh, Clayton Christensen wrote a book called Disrupting Class in which he called online education a disruptive innovation. This is a graph of how disruptive innovations essentially enter the market. They start in a usually dealing with non-market situations, eventually re reach comparable results, and, and then become the method of choice. One example that he used in his book was uh, transistors taking over for vacuum tubes. Probably none of you can even remember a vacuum tube, is that right? Uh, but transistors originally had very poor quality uh, of, of electronic cap capacity. Now the only thing that they were used for were these little pocket radios that, that teenagers would carry around so that they could listen to their music. Eventually though, they became the only thing that was used in the, in the industry. We're not exactly saying that online education is going to be the only thing, but we, we do feel like it will become the method of choice. But just as transistors had to evolve in order to do that, online education has the same problem. It needs to evolve. And so we entitled this presentation, Climbing the S-Curve. Most of the, of the online education is now uh, dealing with this sec section of the market. We feel like Primavera is about here. We hope to be up here within a couple of years. And there's a couple of things that we need to, to do in the design thing in order to, to make that happen. I was trained as an instructional designer with the old Addy method, so I, my apologies to you, uh, Andy, but I'm, I'm going to do this under the thing. Thank you. I'm, I'm very forgiving. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when we first started, we noticed that uh, the students that we had, we had the, were the typical double hump distribution. You know what I'm talking about with that? Yeah, if you, if you do a, a distribution curve, you have a bunch of them here that had a, a um, entering GPA of 1.1. And if you you had very few here, and then you had a smaller hump here with a with a, about a 2.9 median GPA, uh, and very little th things in between. Uh, we we were wondering about why that would be and how we were going to deal with that. You have to deal with both segments of the market as well as this. In looking at that, uh, obviously also we needed to to teach bring them all up to the the standards, which by the way are now changing to the Common Core standards. And we know that the resources we had were things that we could either license ourselves, produce ourselves, or uh, just get from the, the open market. We kind of steered away from the, from the open source after a while because they changed so often that it would require a new re revision of our courses with almost every month. So we steered away from that and went to licensed uh, things and, and then augmented that put them together with our in-house uh, curriculum design. <clears throat> One of the things, though, that, that became immediately apparent be that was the difference between traditional education and online education is with online education, where it's total, totally online, you have to deal with the, the student motivation. If they're not motivated to, to continue the, the course, they stop. Now, in a traditional school, when I taught there, what would happen if they weren't motivated to do it? They would create disruptions. They would talk up, they would start texting, whatever they would do just to disrupt the class. You don't have that in an online education. 
But what you do have is students that just don't move anywhere if they're not motivated. So the first thing that we were looking for was some model of motivation that would work. Many of you might be familiar with the ARCS method from John Keller, correct? I just want to check, okay. That was our original model, and I was doing a master's degree trying to figure out uh, how the ARCS would work in an online environment. And for, I was getting results all over the place. Some of the students responded very positively to that type of instructional design. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, ARC stands for Attention, Relevance, Competence, and Satisfaction. You try and de design all of those elements as you go through the course. But I couldn't understand at that point why some of them did not. Then I ran into a, a, a study or a model that was put forth by a team called Reinberg, Vol Volmeyer, and Rollett, I think, are the ones that wrote it. But it uh, essentially goes something like this, that you have a, a series of, of events going from the situation that you are here to some positive consequence over here. In between, there's an action, read my handwriting, and there's an outcome. Students... Uh, come in one of three different modes, according to the, the model and, and according to our experience. Either they think that by being in the situation, that will guarantee them a certain outcome, which will then lead to the, their desired consequence, or they think that by focusing on the outcome, that will bring the consequence, or they think that by doing the action, that will give them the outcome, which will then get the consequence. The ones that are the real problem are these that take any, any responsibility for action they, they put on the school or the teacher. And that constitutes roughly 60 to 70 percent of the K-12 students that we deal with. They also, because there's no action involved, they don't respond to the ARCS method. There was a study done by a guy by the name of Herman Asleitner that detailed that in the college setting, and we were able to apply that on K-12. So we recognized that we had to move students from this, this model here, the SO, into an action, or at least an outcome uh, model of thinking or expectancy with the word that they used. We could do that by a number of ways. You can either increase the control that you have on the student. We did a little bit of that by uh, putting in what's called sequence control, where they have to click into a, a task before they go on to the next. Uh, but in most cases, what we found was that if you give them a structure where you have a, a lot of teacher-student interaction, somebody following up with them, giving them the idea that they, they have to do something on a, on a consistent basis. Most of them would respond to that. The other motivational technique we used was a variation of video game technology where you use high visual content, you have uh, levels of progression and immediate feedback. <coughs> that tends to incite the brain to continue on. So that was one of the things we were looking at in the, in the design. Uh, I mentioned sequence control versus open access. The, se the sequence control, at least at this point, seems to have increased our course completion by about 10%. <coughs> In the development, um, we originally started with an open source LMS um, done by Jones University. Our course completion under that uh, uh, type of delivery was roughly 10%. Um, so we, we figured that, that we needed something that was a little more uh, interactive. We went to Blackboard. Um, the course completion rates jumped by about 25%, to about 35% completion. Um, through a number of different things, we finally decided we needed our own LMS, so we developed it. And um, probably not just because of that, but during that development phase, the course completion rates are now at about 75%. Uh, go ahead. I guess 
<coughs> not following on that, the last thing that you talked about, how, what do you think the underlying re reason for the jump in performance just by switching the tool was? Did the, did the, did the affordances of the tool allow certain kinds of interactions yes. that were not possible in the open source? No, yeah, server? and this is a good time for me to answer the question about the different types of, of communication. In the new LMS, we have uh, at least five. One is the blog that comes up. Uh, the teacher blogs with the, with the student. Uh, every time they enter the, the class, that's the first thing they see uh, every day. Uh, it's a continuing blog. So that's one of them. There's the uh, customization or personalization that, uh, we, that uh, uh, content that you were talking about earlier. That the, the teacher goes in and customizes or personalizes that, that content for their method of teaching to their students. There is uh, a, uh, the, an opportunity for feedback <coughs> on, um, on projects and, um, on, and other uh, quizzes and, and so on and so forth. There's a feedback that the teacher can give on all of those things. Another way of doing that. There is an, an online threaded discussion, which is centered on either open-ended questions or case studies. And finally, there is a three-tiered messaging system that uh, is common to the entire school. Uh, you can give a general message, you can give one to a class, or you can give one to a individual student. What's that? Yes, yeah, so I said at least. We've also added uh, the synchronous learning tools that uh, where the teacher and student will meet on conferencing software and will uh, hammer out uh, some sort of a tutoring session. There's also uh, phone and text and email, which is done outside the LMS, but uh, does uh, constitute a, a, another way that they, they communicate with each other. Is so that you, an so you didn't have an open source system that provided these things? These things were not available through the, the open source and weren't at the time we did it. Uh, some of them now have that, but, uh, but all of these things, no, I don't think you'll find them anywhere else. But that was the, the idea was to increase that that action, that communication, interaction between teacher and student. In many respects, you could call our instructional design blended in the fact that it has the the online component, but it has much more teacher-student interaction than you would find anywhere else. So far, so good. All right, uh, we've mentioned the social media. Why don't we go to the next one? Uh, there are a few other issues that we've that we've dealt with. Yeah, I'm going to just look through these real quick. I, I don't know that that we need to talk about each of these for lack of time. Ask me the questions afterwards if you'd like. But the, the software we've developed, the evaluation tools we have have developed, and what we're looking at right now as we go up the, this S curve is more project-based simulations. Uh, Reteaching, so that we can go to ma master teaching uh, uh, format where the student doesn't necessarily get a grade, but does in uh, demonstrate that they have mastery of a particular concept or, or uh, skill. And finally, just going to, we'll skip over the rest of it, but the idea is, is that as we go up this S-curve, that we have to become different. Just, I was going to mention something about this, but maybe I ought to. We use the Harvard Business System model to uh, institute projects, that are, some of which are collaborative, most of them are done individually. But the idea was that much of the grade would come from the student demonstrating that they could actually do something with the, the stuff that they had learned. In so doing, the teacher can get a better idea of how the, the student is progressing through the course, can also uh, give, uh, 
be able to compare what they see with the project, with what they see with the discussions, with what they see on the exams, giving a complete evaluation tool. It, it also eliminates a lot of the, the uh, cheating that uh, goes with you know having somebody else produce it for you because it becomes immediately apparent that somebody else produced it for you. Or if somebody else takes your exam, it becomes almost immediately apparent because the teacher and student have so much interaction, it, uh, they get a, a better idea of what the students like than if, even if they used a, a biometric keyboarding system which uh, identifies the, the identity. Our teachers have told us that they, can, they know more about what the students learn in this way than they have ever done before. So, uh, go to the next one. In, the conclusions is that as we go up this, as our, as our online methods improve, we have, we have seen not only better outcomes, but better acceptance, both by teachers, administration, and students, in the way that the, the, the courses are taught and presented. Uh, we, in, the, in the future, we're, we're thinking that we're going to have a total project-based instruction, mastery teaching uh, model. The, the only thing that we're really worried about right now is how we're going to communicate that to BYU or other universities that this student uh, is an A student, because all of them will be A students. But when that comes uh, about, we feel like that, that online education will be the, the method of choice. It has so many things that we're doing right now that you could not get anywhere else. And even and as we go forward, uh, that, that technology is going to allow that more and more until we, I think you'll see that it does fulfill the destiny that it uh, was promised in the, in the book. Questions? I just have a quick question. Um, with the interaction between the student and the uh, teacher, like you were saying, it seems like there would be a lot of involvement. How large are your class sizes? The class sizes are actually uh, comparable to what uh, other, the, the, they put a limit of 35 okay. per class. Um, most of them are in the 25 to 30 range. But the technology and the, and the LMS that, with the software that we have right now, it enables the teacher to do much more than what they would do before. Among other things, any of you that have ever taught know that you don't have to spend, that much of your time is spent in a traditional classroom with classroom management. Um, here, they're, that's gone. So the teacher can, can focus almost entirely on the instruction of content and, and um, skills. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, you take lesson planning out of their role and you take the classroom management out and they can really focus on communication and instruction and grading and providing feedback. Yeah. Most of the teachers that, uh, well all of the teachers that, that stay at Prima Vera Prefer, prefer that to the traditional model. In the back. If we wanted to crawl around in your high school, could we get some kind of password to let us look at it? Uh, possibility. Uh, so I can talk to you personally? Yeah, please ask us afterwards. Uh, we'll, we've done that for, for others, but, but we kind of like to limit that to, uh, for yeah, obvious reasons. We just don't want everybody yeah. to Not a problem. Could you talk to your um, plans for the future any more than just increasing the numbers? Are you planning to go out to other states? Uh, yes. How do you see this proliferating? Yeah, uh, Dave probably ought to answer that one. I'm, I'm new at the uh, ABA and Primavera past few months. <coughs> we are uh, already in California, somewhat in Oregon, uh, and we're working vigorously here in Utah to get, uh, get a program going in the near future. That's our intention, is to, to grow this, get on the radar. We've been off the radar. Uh, we haven't actively pursued external opportunities. We've been building this great school, and we have the know-house, and now it's time. And then I would also add to that, as far as the, like the technologies are concerned, we're always in a continuous progression and enhancement of the technologies, and, and some of what Jared was talking about, as far as an object learning objects and mastery instruction, um, we're looking at, you know, rewriting the learning management system and embedding more collaborative tools and, you know, as technology improves, we try to stay up with technology and use it to its potential for education. 
How many of your students have learning disabilities that would normally appear in classrooms? 12% uh, <coughs> have individual education uh, programs written. Uh, how many of those are actual learning disabilities is not, has not been determined, but uh, quite a number of them. The state of Arizona, when they came to audit us, uh, they had planned to, to be there, what was it, four, three day audit. They left after one and called us to a model program. The students have, through an online program like this, have many more adaptations, accommodations, and uh, uh, abilities to go at their own pace than they would in a, in a traditional environment. You, you spoke about how the instructors feel like they know more about their students because of the increase of interactions that are possible. Have you looked into how the students feel about their connection with the professor as well, sort of from their perspective? Yes, but I will tell you it's a biased sample because uh, it's an end of course survey, so it's the, the successful students that we get. But on the, the uh, five point Likert scale, that particular area gets rated at about a 4.2. We're, the school is continuously flooded by, you know, great uh, support of uh, testimonial emails about great experiences students have had. Um, typically, it's you hear more about the complainers than the positive experiences, but at Primavera they hear a lot of positive experiences. Um, for the people that don't have a successful experience, it's typically uh, oftentimes technology related, or they just... The, kind of what Jared was talking about here, they just didn't, ex it was expectations. They had an expectation that this would be easy and they wouldn't really have to spend time or try to learn. And so they just, you know, they didn't have a good experience because this is harder than a real school or, you know, the, the, the expectations were very different. And we, uh, Curtis and Jared and Dave, we want to thank you for being here. Now, we, we have a, a lunch feed you, you guys let them get their bowl of soup first, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because these guys are eat like cockroaches. Uh, <laughs> uh, we want to thank you for this presentation. It was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah.